Okay, I'm going to ask you to stand as we take our red hymn book and sing all three verses to 478, Constantly Abiding. I hope you'll think of these words to this song as, we, uh, as we've prayed and are thinking about <clears throat> the blessings that God gives us, but also the requests that we have concerning needs for friends and neighbors and friends. 478, all three verses, please. <laughs> There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave. A peace it will not take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a dove, I have a peace that has come there to stay. Constantly abiding. Jesus is mine, constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers of so kind, I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. seem to sing of a Savior and King when peace sweetly came to my heart. Troubles all fled away and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, how gracious Thou art. Constantly abiding is mine, constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers are so kind. I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. This treasure I have in a temple of clay, while here on his footstool I roam. But he's coming to take me some glorious day over there to my heavenly home. Constantly abiding. Jesus is mine, constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers are so kind. I will never leave thee, is mine. Thank you for your singing. Please be seated. We want to look at Psalm 19, and I want to preface this with a few words. It's, I know Pastor Walker has been referring to this several times in the last few weeks, but this is one of my pet peeves, and I'm not preaching to anyone in particular, but there are so many Christians that compartmentalize their belief system. When they're in church, and if the preacher's preaching on uh, creation, they believe in creation. Then they go out on, in the world the next day, and they some, or even catch the news tonight, and they'll tell you about some uh, galaxy that they're trying to find. It's so many million light years away, and they right away they're into the evolutionary thought process. I like to say it this way. Well, you know me, I like to joke anyway. You see, evolutionists do with years what Congress does with dollars. 
Every time they run into a problem, they throw a few mil million at it, maybe a hundred million, maybe a billion or two, and that's supposed to solve the problem. Well, it hasn't in either case. But today, tonight, we're going to look at something here. There's a need for man to receive and respond to God's revelation by renouncing and repenting from his rebellion. General revelation speaks of God's glory, while spatial revelation speaks of God's grace. And in this passage, this chapter, we'll see both of those. And we'll, in verses 1 through 6, is God's revelation through the world of science. And then verses 7 through 11 is God's revelation through the words of Scripture. And lastly, verses 12 through 14 is a godly response to his work of salvation. And this is what we need to have in our lives. Because God's revelation through the world of science, I can, it's kind of a pet peeve with me, so I could get off on the track there and never get through tonight. I know you have refreshments back there. But you see, first of all, verse 1, look at it. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We see God's revelation through the world of science in its congruity, its harmony. Everything works together. Because one of the favorite ones that I use is you take, as the earth spins around on its axis around the sun, the gravitational pull of the sun is exactly equal to the centrifugal force of the spin of the earth. If one were greater than the other, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. Either we would be sucked into the sun or we'd be spinning out endlessly in space, no oxygen to breathe. And by the way, there's a big deal. They think they might have found water on Mars. Well, you just try drinking, just living on water. Now, you have to have water once every three, three days, every 21 days for food, or you're not going to survive. But you can't survive on water alone. There was just a thing this evening on the news that one lady was drinking too much water, and that can cause physical problems because we're supposed to be balanced in what we... I, I, I'm a poor one to talk about that because I don't... I don't eat properly, I don't uh, exercise properly, but I'm 83 years old, I'm still here, and a lot of my peers have gone on to be with the Lord. They left me behind. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's up to the Lord. But we see that this, all this works together. Everything is, all these planets and these stars, and our star is a middle class, our, our sun is a middle class star. And again, God put them all there for a purpose. And now I had a good friend of mine. He was a, I don't want to take him down in any way because he was a very courageous missionary. He was in Iran when the Shah was still in charge before old Kukumini came in. And the Lord laid it on his heart to fill up his trunk full of Farsi Bibles and see Afghanistan speaks the same language that Iranians do. It's from the old Persian. Well, he, if he'd have been caught with that trunk load of Bibles, the best he could hope would be for prison time. Stopped in a little store, began to witness to a fellow, and this fellow turned out to be a Christian. He was trying to hold a Bible study. He only had two books of the Bible. He said, Dean, could you get me a whole Farsi Bible. Brother Dean says, going out in the alley here, <laughs> open up the trunk, it's full of Bibles. This guy just started crying. But we ought to be thankful that we, in the country we live, we can still, how many Bibles do you have in your house? I have them all over the place. We still live in, a, even though Satan is against us, he's against Christianity, we can still, you can go to the, well, they don't have five and dimes anymore, but discount store, except for Target, you can buy a Bible. Target doesn't sell them anymore. They also, why did they get hit with that? They had, uh, they call it unisex. There is no such thing. You're either one or the other. They had restrooms, and 
people quit going to Target. They had a quarter, old quarter there. They lost several billion dollars. They figured better put the men's and women's back in there. <laughs> anyway, and look at verse 2. It's consistency. Day into day utter a speech, and night into night showeth knowledge. It's there all the time. Nothing changes in this. God speaks to us through his general revelation. And by the way, Everything is special about it, because God created it all. And all the laws of science, God created those laws. We we're talking, I, I don't remember, maybe Brother Walker, but a miracle, I believe, is a suspension of natural law. It doesn't do away with it. It just suspends it for that miracle. Otherwise, it comes right back in, well, in our... Exodus Sunday School class. You know, it was a miracle when God stood that water like this. I was talking about at Church Universal Studios many, many years ago. And they had a problem when they made the movie, Ex The Exodus. I never saw the whole thing. I've seen excerpts and read excerpts from it. But they had a problem how they're going to wall this water up. They tried it with glass and it just reflect the lights of the cameras right back at them. How they did that was gelatin. Can you imagine how many truckloads of gelatin they had? And uh, well, Brother Snyder and I were talking about, can you imagine those fellas walking through them? By the way, it's two million strong. They're walking through there, and you can see this fish open his mouth. Right here, one over here. You see a guy fishing over there. <laughs> And they walk, that was the miracle. Once the Israelites got through, all God had to do was remove his miracle. And water seeks its own level. Boom, came right back. Now, you read a commentary by modernists, they'll tell you that that was not the Red Sea, that was the Reed Sea. And the water was only ankle to knee deep. Well, I used to ride horses quite a bit. I even herded cattle. But I'm not going to get on the back of any horse that's dumb enough to drown in knee-deep water. <laughs> so when they try to create a, uh, do away with a miracle, they create a greater miracle. When I was still in the liberal church, modernist church, they were teaching that the feeding of the 5,000, by the way, that was plus the women and children, probably another 2,000. They said, well, Jesus had a psychological ability that each one of them, they got a little piece of fish, a little piece of bread, and they felt like they were filled. And I asked, even then, I asked the teacher, I said, how did he psychologically fill up 12 baskets of leftovers? And you, can you imagine that little fella coming home and say, hey, mom, look at my leftovers from the lunch you packed me today. <laughs> You see, just believe the Bible for what it says. We may not understand everything. We won't until we get there. Paul says we look through our glass darkly. But we're going to understand it one day when we see Jesus face to face. Then, but right now, just believe it, even if you don't understand it completely. In fact, miracles are pretty hard to understand. You can't explain them physically by physical science. And... Uh, Put one more kick in towards evolution. It claims to be science. It's couched in scientific jargon, but it violates the most basic rules of science. You learned that in your elementary or middle school science. It's impossible to have an effect that's greater than its cause. Evolution demands it every step of the way, every micro step, it has to get better and better and better. And then the first and second laws of thermodynamics, especially that second. Because you studied, we're, we're experiencing the second law of thermodynamics. My wife and I, we just don't get around like we used to. Can't do what we used to. We're packing up, we're going to be moving someday. But came across my old baseball glove I had. I was going to give it to 
grandson, but he didn't need it either, so we just donated it to the secondhand store. I said, what am I going to do with that? Can you imagine me playing shortstop? And I get a hot sizzling grounder, and I go down to get it and ask the rest of the team to pick me back up. <laughs> we, we are experiencing the second law of thermodynamics, which is, says everything's in a process of decay. Anyway, we know that this, when God created, everything is consistent. Now, it takes a miracle to vary that consistency. Now, a lot of times people use the word miracle when it's really just God's providential guidance. I remember when I was in college, there were two young fellows arguing there. They are young theologians, freshmen in college, and one of them said something about uh, luck. The other said, I don't believe in luck. What do you call it then? He said, providential guidance. He said, lucky thing we have that, huh? <laughs> but it's true. God oftentimes just works within his own laws of nature in our favor. For instance, you go to the mailbox tomorrow, and you get an unexpected check for $500. You're going to be pretty happy about that. And this is God's working through his providence. It wasn't any miracle. It didn't just uh, happen out of blue air, you know, out of the air and stuff it in the mailbox. But on the other hand, of course, if you go to the mailbox and find a, a bill for $500 you weren't expecting, you're not going to be so happy about that. <laughs> but anyway, the next thing we see is its comprehensiveness. Verses 3 and the first part of verse 4. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the world. And the words at the end of the earth, world, or the of the earth. Now you think of that. There's, that's why Paul could say in Romans chapter 1, they're without excuse. Anywhere in the world, at any time, we can look at what God has created right around us. You have no excuse for not believing in God. It's there. All you have to do is look at it. And then uh, <clears throat> there's no speech or language. It, you can't say, well, I never did learn English. I can't read my King James Bible. First of all, this Bible has been translated into nearly every major language there is by now. Nevertheless, you don't even have to know. You know, I, I w when I was in college, there was a man from India that came over to get his doctor's degree. Dr. Varghese. He, got, he was led to the Lord in a rice paddy by an illiterate farmer. We don't have an excuse either. You don't have to have a degree in theology to lead someone to the Lord. Just tell them what happened to you. I mean, that's what the Apostle Paul did. Hey, did I ever tell you about the time I was on the road to Damascus? And man, I had all these warrants. I was going to put those Christians in jail. And then I had a light come down from it. He tells of his ex salvation experience. You know how you got saved. Tell other people the same way. But nevertheless, it's comprehensive. It, it's around the world. Even in the most um, darkest tribe of any continent, that has never come and crossed with the gospel, still he knows something of, somebody made this. When I first got saved, I remember delivering for Safeway stores back at Trailer Inn, sitting on a dock and just looking up at all those stars up there. And I thought, you know, the same God that created this whole thing lives in my heart. There's a song oh, Pat Boone used to sing, and he was a pretty good singer. I don't agree with his swimming pool baptism in Las Vegas, but nevertheless, he used to sing, How Big is God? Big and wide and wonderful, but small enough to live in my heart. That's a concept that's really hard to wrap your mind around. But just look at it. Colorado's great for this. We have some of those beautiful starlit nights. 
Then we go on to, in its consciousness, the latter part of verse 4, in them that he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of its chamber and re rejoicing as a strong man to run a race. Think of that when the bridegroom comes. Hey, you, all you guys, remember your wedding? You, you could, usually I'd have them come out from this side. And they'd stand there. And I changed something in my wedding ceremony and I perform it. I used to have them just come, the bride or her father would bring her down there and he'd stand on that side to where he's equal with the mother of the bride and wait till the pastor says, who giveth this woman to be uh, wed to this man? And he would say, I do, and he sits down. I changed that. I, thought, I had a little help on that. I thought, wait a minute, that's not quite right. So what I would do, I, when I would say that, the groom would step about two, three steps this way. The bride and the father would be over on this side. He'd take the girl's hand and come up and put her hand into the groom's hand. That's a transfer of authority. Oh, women, they don't like that. But then he would say, when you say, who giveth this woman to be married to this man? He would say, her mother and I. Because you can bet mom had something to say about that. <laughs> but as a spokesman for the family, he said, her mother and I. I like to do things right, according to the scripture. But anyway, it's consciousness. In verse 6, having going forth is from the end of the heavens and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. Everything, again, how that the whole universe works. Everybody can see that. And it's conscious in our minds. These people, they call themselves scientists, and we're not against science, real science. Science is a study of God's work. Theology is a study of God's word. And we're not against that. God created it. But, oh, they come up with all that. And it can be convincing. But just come back to the word of God. Just believe God's word. Now, if we can't believe Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, how do we know we can believe John chapter 3? It's all in question. I remember a good friend of mine, I had him in my church, was Dr. David Otis Fuller. He had a little saying he had. He said, Satan began his war against God, seated under the tree of knowledge, and he's been camped there ever since. That's where it's difficult. We send our young people off to the universities and colleges, and a good many of them, their faith is destroyed by the time of the end of the first semester. Because they can sound real convincing. Even the little ones, now they don't say it in these many words, but the idea they're portraying to these youngsters is now, when mom and dad tell you to wash the dishes, take the trash out, you do that, and you be nice to mom and daddy. When it comes to Knowing things, we're the ones that have the authority. Look at the degree. We have initials after our name. I used to tease one of my professors, Dr. Houghton. And that guy got degrees from everywhere. I said, a few more, Doc, and you'll be a full circle. But that, all these, there's nothing wrong. With, in fact, we should study. The Bible tells us study to show ourselves approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What's that mean by dividing it? You compare scripture with scripture. And you know what you're talking about. If some Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door, you know how to handle that fellow. And by the way, you read what John Reed says in his epistles, don't bid him God's speed when he leaves. Anyway, we need to know that. Now, verse 7 talks about it's going into God's revelation through the words of Scripture. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is what? 
is perfect. Now, you can take it in any meaning you want of that. It's complete. It's also flawless. Now, that's my, one of my pet peeves as well. Uh, I wrote a tract several years ago, because the college I went to, well, I started off, it was pretty good, but we got the wrong half of the San Francisco Seminary when they split. And they come in, the next thing you're telling us that the NASV was supposed to be so much better. I didn't know any better. I took them. I was only working, just starting to work on my bachelor's degree. These guys had master's and doctor's degrees. So I remember going to an ordination council up here at Elmwood Baptist years ago. A friend of mine, Bob Stewart, was being uh, ordained there. And I had bought my wife. That was my wife, Judy. She's with the Lord now. But I bought her an ASV. And I happened to carry that with me. Some of you know Brother Judd Riley. He's a nice fellow. He confronted me. He said, why are you packing that thing? <laughs> oh, I started parroting my professor. Oh, it's a better translation. Oh, he said, why is it a better translation? Well, it's translated from the better tra uh, manuscripts. Oh, why are they the better manuscripts? Well, they're older. They date to the fourth century. Why the ones behind are... King James, they're only in the 11th or 12th century. He said, now the last thing you said is true. They are older. But you know, they were lost for 1,500 years. That's approximately 41 generations. That means that God either lost or hid his true word from his people for 1,500 years and then he held, held his King James up. He said, what I have in my hand is an imposter. And all those martyrs that died, they died for an imposter. The Reformation was completely built on an imposter. The Great Awakening in our own country was built on an imposter. The great revival meetings like Billy Sundays and so forth on an imposter. By that time, I said, that's not the God I worship. So I went home, and I got everything I could get on that and read it thoroughly. And I came under conviction. We had the Word of God all along. I don't need, I remember Brother Roloff says, it doesn't need rewritten, just needs reread. Not so hard to believe, just a little hard to obey. Well, that's true. We have the Word of God. And the law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, who wasn't just preached recently about making wise? Going to 2 Timothy, uh, well, chapter 3, and then going back to chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. That Lois and Eunice, that's grandma and, gr and mom, all Timothy, taught him the scriptures. It made him wise unto salvation. Now, we talk about wise in Proverbs. There are three words that are very much connected, but not synonymous. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. You can have great knowledge and have no wisdom. And, again, you have to understand what you're learning. You can read. Some people have a photographic memory. They can remember what they read. Be careful of that because it might not be good stuff you're reading. But think of that. Years ago, I was teaching a truck driving school, and that was one thing I concentrated. I would teach them the whys as well as the whats. Because they could read that manual and pass the written test. But what do they know? You sure wouldn't want to... Hire them, put them in your 18 wheeler, send them to Los Angeles with an 80,000 pound. Well, if he gets there, you might have a truck driver. If he doesn't wipe out a bunch of people on the way, <laughs> including himself. But I always, we need to know, know not only what, just memorizing scripture is good, but you have to know what it's saying. First thing, this is what Pastor Walker taught in the last semester of his college class there, hermeneutics. 
you learn how to study the Bible. I told him, I said, I didn't even know Harmon's last name until I went to Bible college. But <laughs> you learn how to study it because people could take scripture out of context. My dad was debating a Jehovah's Witness one time. And of course, at JW, he quoted scripture. My dad said, I can quote scripture too. And Judas went out and hanged himself. Go thou do likewise. What thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> there, you quoted scripture, right? Understand, first of all, you need to know, why is this person, or who is it writing? Why is he writing it? And to whom is he writing it? And why then did the Holy Spirit inspire that? And what's there for me? Because we don't just want to rattle it off. I remember pastoring in Hayden, Colorado, and there was a big feud between two families over which one memorized the most scripture. I mean, it's really something to fight about, huh? It's, it's ridiculous. But at any way, it's infallible, it's immutable, it doesn't change. Isaiah ch chapter 40, verse 7, or I'm sorry, verse 8, tells us that the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Lord, the word of the Lord, or the word of God will, it'll be around forever. I can't quote it right off, but I'll catch it here. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40. I should have had these done. Okay, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And then we look in the New Testament concerning that. Matthew 24, 35. Again, Jesus is emphasizing the very same thing. That the word of God will be here. It'll be here after I'm gone. God's word. They, you know, they've tried to destroy that. And I like to say this, Satan has tried burning it. They had Bible burnings. He tried to ban it. It continued. But the most effective thing he has found is to pervert it. And that tract I wrote, and you may have, I might have some extras, but anyway, it shows you how consistently the NASV downplays and even denies the deity of Jesus Christ and of the Trinity. One of the favorite ones, 1 John 5, 7. You go to any modern, they'll say, oh, that's not in the original. Well, the first translation of the New Testament, now why can't I think it? I can't think of the name of it. Brother Tim, you know it. Uh, it was translated by, it's the translators themselves were younger uh, contemporaries with John who wrote the epistle. Okay? I almost have it. It starts with a P. But that was the first translation. Again, Dr. Fuller helped me out on that. He was, besides starting his own society, which Bible society, he was a member of the Trinitarian Bible Society in London, England. And under glass, they have a copy of this Bible, the first translation of the New Testament. Now, if you can translate that into modern English, it reads just like our King James does, 1 John 5, 7. And that's important because, see there again, they want to deny the Trinity. And it's ironic that there are a lot of church buildings out here that will have Trinity such and such church, and they don't even believe in the Trinity. For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, which is Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's the Trinity. And they want to take that out in the NESV and almost all of your other modern translations. Now, I have to give a little credit, more than I like. The new King James is a little bit better than the rest, but they still, in several passages, went to that corrupt 
transcript that dates back to the fourth century. The, re the reason why the ours behind our King James only go back to the 11th or 12th, because people studied the Bible. They prayed over it. They wept over it, and it had to be copied. Now, I could, I don't, in my library, I had, there were books I had to buy when I was in college. One was Biology by uh, Helena, Helena Curtis. It was because we didn't have a Christian biology book at that time. It was at the college level. They only had high school. We did use it, too. Well, I had that, and I had to take philosophy course. I had that up in the top shelf, and I had to take psychology. Right now, psychology and about three bucks will get you a cup of coffee. And you cannot reconcile that with the Word of God. It's impossible. There are three main schools of psychology. One of them is Freudianism. He was a pervert. Then you have behavioralism. E.F. Skinner, Pavlov. You know, and there the Pavlov had his dogs, and if you did certain things to a dog, you'd do certain things. Well, okay, that doesn't explain it. Then the, the one that I would have ascribed to before I got saved was Rogerian psychology. Because there it's self-actualization. You know, Freud wants to blame everything on your heritage or your potty training. Behaviorism, Skinner, he wants to blame everything on your environment. And Rogers, he just said, don't blame anybody, just do something about it. I used to use my little Pekingese terrier dog. I called her the Peek Terrier. Put him in the backyard, and I had a chain link fence. I said, some of people like that old hound dog. He'll lie out there in the middle of the yard and, and moan and groan because he's all fenced in. That little Peek Terrier, he did something about it. He learned how to climb that chain link fence and fall over. I fixed his. I just lowered that fence a little bit below the bar so all those sharp things are sticking up above the bar and he ripped up in the belly of, that was enough of that. He didn't do it anymore. <laughs> but again, you see, you can't reconcile that with the Word of God. The Bible says we're born in sin. We are sinners both by birth and by choice. And we're not, none of us are righteous in our own because the righteousness we have is in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because our righteousness, and I won't go into the details of this, and Isaiah 64 tells us that it's as filthy rags. So nobody's going to get to heaven on no matter how good you want or think you might be, you have to go in the goodness of Jesus Christ. Well, we've got to go in his preference. Verse 10. Well, verse 8 and 9 is his purity. It's clear and it's clean. Uh, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And then it's preferences. Verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, then much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. You think of that. How wonderful the word of God is. Gold, I was talking, Patty, I said, you know, the military gets everything mixed up. We always think of gold as much, much more precious than silver, right? But in the military, it's the opposite. See, a second lieutenant has a gold bar. It's not really gold. We call them butter bars. But the first lieutenant has silver. Then you get a major has gold oak leaves. Lieutenant colonel has silver. So they put silver. Well, that's the military. <laughs> anyway, but more precious than gold. Now, you have advertisements on TV to buy the gold. And it's a little bit misleading. They'll tell you how much more gold is worth today than it was five years ago. In actuality, the gold is the same price it ever was. 
it's your dollar that's worth less. It's just a bunch of empty paper. I told a fellow today, uh, back when GW was president, he went down to the Potomac River, he had a silver dollar, and went, then it went plunk in the middle of the river. One of his aides, he said, Mr. President, it said that when George Washington was president, he threw a silver dollar all the way across this river. He said, it just goes to show, dollar doesn't go as far as it used to. Then the purpose in verse 11, it warns of danger. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. We're warned against the dangers of dabbling in sin, yielding to the old flesh. And then we notice it warns of sin, Satan, and salvation. Here, in keeping of them, there is great reward because it warns of rebellion, repentance, redemption. These are warnings we have with that, through the, throughout the scriptures. It tells us we don't have any excuse. None of us will go stand before the Lord and say, the devil made me do it. Or that boy or that girl or that man or that woman tempted me. They may have, but you had to say yes or no. You can't go to anything like that. We're there by the grace of God. Now, God, the godly response to his work of salvation, verse 12, forgiveness for our private sins. Who can understand his error? Cleanse thou me from secret. And the translators added faults. They could have said sins. But I'll tell you something. They might be secret as far as other people knowing, but they're not secret from God. When I was a young kid, we, the song, one of the songs we sang in the church was, You cannot hide from God no matter what you do. His eye is always fixed on you. You, can't, you can hide from people, but you can't hide from God. So, then again, it's forsaking of presumptuous sins. Verse 13, that one can really bother us. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. What's that? Presuming on the grace of God. You're saying, and I don't want to ask for hands on this. You say, well, I'm, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven anyway. I'll just indulge a little bit, and then I'll ask God's forgiveness. Well, he'll forgive you, but we need to stay away from those kind of sins. Why do we want them anyway? That's rebellion. And you know, we've been studying also about rebellion. God says rebellion is as, it doesn't say it is, it's as the sin of witchcraft. So, warns of sin, Satan and salvation, and it warns of rebellion, repentance and redemption. So again, the forgiveness of private sins, the forsaking of presumptuous sins, don't want that. Look at Numbers 1530. Uh, you know, look at the gainsayers of Kor. God just opened up and they went in. Like that fellow, he only wondered what he deserved. Well, that could be something like that. <laughs> if we got what we deserve. Now, the fashioning of a prudent servant is in verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That should be the prayer of each one of us here tonight, and those of you on Zoom as well. That should be the prayer that we pray, because the words of my mouth, Hasty words. And there are words that we can use that are not necessarily taking the Lord's name in vain, but they're just as evil. Are our words encouraging to other people? Or do we put them down? You know, we have to be careful of that, what our words are. And here's something scientific. When we first made the records, you know, I still have those old 33 and a third records for a record player, a good friend of mine, and I 
sings a song, uh, uh, Mark, I can't even think of his last name. I told it to you earlier, Patty. But he comes to First Baptist about once a year. He and two guys from First Baptist have made some some CDs that are really good. But you record these voices, and this was just on a kind of a plastic disc. Now, then they went from that to a cassette. Now they have the CDs, and they have these little bitty things now that sing even more, uh, in, in better recordings. But the Bible tells us that our, our words are recorded in the walls, even in the rocks. Now, if man can bring our voices out through a machine, what could God do? <laughs> it's, there's recordings, and it's a physical thing. But we have to be careful about that. We don't want that. We need to fashion ourselves as a prudent servant of God and the acceptable in God's sight. Now, it doesn't. we could reprove someone who... We, when is it knowingly uh, involved in sin? But be careful. First Corinthians ten twelve says that him that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. Because we're not above it. None of us here tonight are above any sin. I mean, we have to be on guard because Satan will put the temptations out there, but he can't force us to sin. We have to say yes or no. And to him, we should always say no. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. There again, where is our strength to resist sin? Not in ourselves. Paul says we fight like we're, we're batting the air. We have to re rely on the Holy Spirit of God to take control of us. I was told by some, I think she was a nurse, that something bad happens. You have like five to six seconds as to how you're going to react to that. Whether you're going to react with the power of the Holy Spirit or we're going to react with the natural thing is, like one fellow says, I don't get angry, I just get even. No, we better let the Lord handle that. One little girl, she prayed. She said, Jesus, would you answer the door? Satan's knocking. She wanted Jesus to answer that door. I was, you know what? We can learn things from kids sometimes. Little children. Because they have that simple faith in Jesus Christ. We can get so dignified and so elitist, oh, kind of gloss over that sort of thing. No, sin is real, and none of us are above it. I've often said, if I were God, of course, I wouldn't think like he does, but I'd have given up on me a long time ago. You're not worth it, but it is. Worth it enough that Jesus shed his blood for me and for you. Each one of us. 